thank you for joining the Demystifying Dyslexia program. Wonderful to have everyone here. My name is Diane, and I'll be your host tonight on behalf of Vaughan Public Libraries. I'm an information assistant in youth services with Vaughan Libraries, so I do have an interest in reading and helping children choose a just right book for themselves, which is sometimes harder than expected. Tonight, we are going to take a deep dive into the large topic of dyslexia and receive some helpful information from our speaker. Before I introduce her, please note that we are recording this session so that others who are not able to be here may watch later on Vaughan Public Library's YouTube channel. We will, however, stop the recording before we start the Q&A portion, which, is in, which will be in the last 50 minutes or so of the program. So feel free to uh, record your questions in the chat as they arise, and we hope to get to as many of them as time allows. I am now very pleased to introduce our presenter, Catherine Hayes Waldhuber. Catherine is a learning resource teacher with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. She is a former consultant with past portfolios supporting the strategic priorities of all students reading by the end of grade one. Catherine facilitated and co-constructed the current Hamilton Wentworth District School Board reading strategy based on the science of reading research. A former kindergarten teacher, Catherine was recognized as a Dyslexia Aware Teacher of the Year Global Finalist for the Nessie Learning Program. Catherine is also an Orton Gillingham trained classroom educator a proud parent of a dyslexic daughter and is dyslexic herself. She volunteers with IDA, which is the International Dyslexia Association Ontario chapter. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for doing this. Anytime you're ready. I hope I got all of that correct. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that warm welcome. And I appreciate Diane and Swelm uh, Library who are coordinating this uh, with IDA so that we can raise awareness around dyslexia. So as Diane mentioned, I, um, I am very passionate. This is, I think we're all here um, because we wanna know more or we're advocating for somebody that we love. So we already have this sense of awareness around dyslexia and we wanna deepen our knowledge. So I appreciate you carving out this time to deepen your knowledge. And like I say, it's kind of like an iceberg. The more you just see the tip and the more you know, the more you want to know. So um, that was that's kind of been my journey through through the past, I'm going to say 10 to 15 years. And um, the more I know, the more I, I want to know and I need to know in order to support the learners who um, are in my community, but also in my home. So as Diane mentioned, my daughter is dyslexic. And um, it's been a bit of a a struggle unpacking all of those pieces. And then most recently I found out that I um, also am dyslexic. So it's uh, been quite the journey and um, I'm just so happy that I can help build awareness so that we can have a stronger network around um, our dyslexic uh, students and our, the population that we serve in order to make the struggle a little bit less of a struggle. So I do encourage you to get social. We are, um, it was, October was Dyslexia Awareness Month. So now that we're into, Oct in, in, into November, we're continuing to move on, um, supporting that, that piece. And um, we, we don't want it to just be in one month. So we are aware that dyslexia is present for our whole lives. And so we have that month to really build that awareness, but we want to continue that momentum. Um, to continue that um, awareness. This is a very simple definition of dyslexia. It's a neurologically based condition that affects both word level reading accuracy and also our reading fluency and spelling. Dyslexia is one of the most common causes of reading difficulties. There are children with dyslexia in every classroom. So we say about one in five. Dyslexia is also often described as the unexpected difficulty in learning to read. This has more to do with the common misconception about reading development than it has to do with the true nature of dyslexia. And it's commonly believed that smart kids are, who are immersed in a rich 
literature environment, both at home and at school, will learn to read fairly easily when they get to school. And oftentimes, when a child who is perceived as bright and who has had all of these opportunities to engage in those rich literature um, environments are being raised in those environments and they are still struggling to learn how to read, it is often considered surprising or unexpected. So that might lead um, to the child to be formally assessed for a learning disability. And then eventually the child would be diagnosed with a specific learning disability in reading which is just another term usually for dyslexia. If the child is lucky, they will then receive effective um, intervention and support for dyslexia, and then they will learn how to read. So I'm going to just move past this one. So dyslexia, as we know, is not related to intelligence. There are many um, famous award-winning uh, personalities and people out there who who are very intelligent and who have dyslexia. And so we know that it is not linked to intelligence. Individuals of all levels of intelligence and backgrounds are equally affected by dyslexia and benefit from the same interventions and supports. However, there are these common misconceptions about reading development that have reinforced many harmful um, stereotypes and biases, which often play out in the form of lowered expectations usually of our most vulnerable kids. When reading struggles are attributed to the home environment or a child is perceived as not being particularly bright, reading with reading difficulties are, are not concerned, we don't consider that surprising. So this is why it's really important that we're going to bust some myths. So we have five myths that we're going to bust today about dyslexia. And um, there are a lot of common myths that are harmful to about dyslexia and it was hard to narrow down just a few but we're going to focus on these ones today. So myth number one is that dyslexia if it exists at all is very rare and uh, dyslexia is very real. Well as mentioned already about dyslexia um, it is a brain-based condition it's neurological and scientists from all over the world have identified both functional and structural differences um, in the brains of individuals with dyslexia versus those with without. And there is a, a entire body of research that supports this um, fact that dyslexia is real. And it is now very well established through many different brain imaging studies that dyslexia is real. Um, there is still misinformation and that the belief that learning to read is something that happens easily and for, for most, I'm not going to say most of the population because it's one in five uh, students are usually ha have dyslexia or um, ha have undiagnosed dyslexia. What happens is there is this misinformed belief that we have and that uh, reading happens easily and naturally. And for many people, it does. But for when, when you are struggling and you are dyslexic, it is a very cumbersome um, piece to deal with and when that happens it there is a byproduct that then happens alongside of that with dyslexia and it can um, impact your confidence and create anxiety as well so we're going to go through some of those other byproducts of dyslexia um, when we don't intervene and provide the support that is necessary in order to um, close the gap so Dyslexia is not rare at all, and it is one of the most common reasons that people struggle with learning to read. Putting an exact number on the prevalence of dyslexia is difficult. However, the Ontario Ministry of Education, their own estimate is about 17%, though most individuals, as I mentioned, with dyslexia in Ontario have never been formally diagnosed or provided support. So we're going to move on to the next myth. So, um, People with dyslexia, the myth is that they see letters backwards or moving around the page. And it, dyslexia is not a visual um, issue. It is individuals with dyslexia are no more or less likely to have visual issues than anyone else. Often when we are observing the eye movements of a struggling reader, we are seeing their eyes darting around the page so that they, we associate their eyes moving around with poor reading. But oftentimes what they're doing is trying to 
understand what's on the text and that's why their eyes are darting around the page and they're looking for picture clues and they're, they're looking for what those squiggly lines might actually represent to them. And as kids learn to read, we observe that their eyes, eyes dart around much less. So it's really impor important point that visual therapies to help with tracking, with glasses, with prisms, colored overlays and special fonts are not evidence-based treatments for dyslexia. And only effective treatment for dyslexia is highly quality evidence-based reading instruction. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that because I know that was some of the pieces that Di Diane wanted to touch on. So we will unpack that during our Q&A question at the end. So myth, if parents just read more with their kids, they would learn to read easily. And the fact is that reading to kids is important. It's critical. It develops their vocabulary. It's also a great piece to help build comprehension of higher level text for our students. And um, However, individuals with dyslexia still need evidence-based structured literacy in order to learn how to read. And we're gonna unpack what structured literacy is too during this piece here. And if this myth is that if parents just read to their kids, they would learn to read easily. And we touched on this because it can't, it can't be overstated that this is a myth and it's extremely harmful because it causes unfair judgment and a bias, which can often prevent individuals from receiving the support that they need in order to learn how to read. And often we take a wait and see approach to wait and see if um, it will just click for them. But we know that early intervention is key in order to support all readers, especially dyslexic students. Um, we also hear from parents who seek help for their children that, um, they end up feeling blamed for their child's difficulties. And I know as a parent of a dyslexic student, I, I felt that um, I knew I knew what I needed to do in order to support her. And, but it, when we deliver um, the learning at home in addition to at school, it can be a lot for that child to manage. So I know I felt that on a personal experience as well. And that, you know, well-meaning friends and family often are just well, my child read with such ease, so maybe try this, but dyslexia students need, a, need structured literacy in order to be able to learn how to read. So yes, reading is very important. It builds up vocabulary and it builds that comprehension, but we're gonna unpack some of these other pieces that need to happen in order to close the gap for our students. So. Um, our next myth is kids with dyslexia are just lazy or lack motivation. And again, it's, it's a brain-based difference that children are born with. These kids will not learn to read through willpower alone. And often these children are working or have worked very, very hard um, to get to the progress that they have moved through, um, which often leads to disengagement with reading. And subsequently, when we see disengagement within the, the classroom with reading, we then see behaviors start to emerge. So we really want to make sure that we are reaching these students in a timely manner. Um, the achievement gap widens and contributes to other negative emotional and mental health consequences. And some children express their, these frustrations through antisocial behavior. They may act out at home or in class and they internalize these emotions because what's happening is they're seeing their, their peer group um, moving from the land of what we call reading, learning to read to reading to learn and the fluency then comes. And, and our kids are very aware and they, um, their anxiety can start to emerge because they want to be like their peer group and they feel like there's something wrong with them because they are not um, reading with fluency yet just like their peers and it doesn't come as easy to them. So we really need to intervene early so that we can prevent these negative byproducts from happening. So our last myth today is people with dyslexia cannot learn to read. And this is possibly one of the most um, harmful myths is that some kids are just not readers. There has been um, a move in the last decade in Ontario to accommodate rather than to remediate reading difficulties. Um, and we're encouraged to teach them to live with this limitation by providing them with assistive technology. 
so I know that through lived experiences, um, my daughter, she, and this is where I like to, to share, she at the end of grade two was struggling to read. And so we um, provided her with um, tutoring and at home support. And she has now gone back into the school system at a grade five level. Um, she is reading fluently and she loves reading. She <laughs> wakes up at six in the morning sometimes. And I'm just look, I look in her room and she's sitting there with a book because we intervened for her and we got her the right supports, but it took a lot of advocating in order to do that. So I know that's not always the case for every student and we want to make sure that we change future outcomes for our students and we provide them with the right supports necessary in order to reach them and intervening early helps us do that. So with early identification and intervention and intervention with reading difficulties associated to dyslexia, we it can um, dyslexia can be um, greatly reduced the struggles that those students are then um, living with. So I'm going to play a little clip here. I'm hoping that it it loads. I might load. I'm going to put, put put it on in the background. Sorry, Diana. Just give me one second. Sure. No worries. So this is a really great clip. Um, it is a documentary and there's a lot of documentaries out right now that are, or that are coming out. Actually, I might just bypass it um, and maybe play it at the end while we load some Q and A's because I don't want to take away from our time. But what, this piece really talks about is rethinking dyslexia. And yes, there are, it is a challenge and um, there are some really great pieces of being a dyslexia, dyslexic, per, a person who has dyslexia um, because you see things through a wider lens sometimes as well. So there, there can be some gifts that are associated with it. And I think oftentimes why I like to play this is because as parents, we, often and educators we often think through not not an asset based lens so we really want to refocus that and and think about all the good assets that come along with the, with being dyslexic but also make sure that we are closing that gap and celebrate some of the the strengths that they bring to the table because of they see themselves and that negative self-talk is already so present because they can't read and they and they see that it's visible to them and those students in the classroom. So really building them up and building those strengths and celebrating through an asset-based asset lens for our students. Sorry, I'm just gonna keep moseying on through here. So dyslexia causes two major challenges. As I mentioned in that first slide, when we talked a little bit about um, the brief definition, is um, we have mastering decoding skills. So the ability to identify and manipulate individual speech sounds and words. So I talk about phonemic and phonological awareness. And it's kind of this overarching umbrella term of phonological awareness. And oftentimes you'll see me use my hands when I'm talking about it is this big overarching term. And then we have phonological awareness um, is the overarching term and phonemic awareness being the small unit and unit of sound within a word. So that's where we have difficulty is within those decoding skills and mastering the letter sound associations and also learning those spelling patterns. So these are all pieces that can be explicitly taught to our students with dyslexia in order to close that gap. And then building the neural connection. So individuals with dyslexia often require many more repetitions than a typical reader before a neural pathway is mapped. And we're gonna unpack that a little bit more um, because our brains are wired for, for speech. They're not wired for print. So um, dyslexia is an equity issue and there is, um, usually what happens is students who are most vulnerable or students who have not um, are 
underrepresented um, are often the ones that are struggling. So we really want to make sure that all students, because it is a basic human right to be able to read, and that is what the right to read goes through, is that it is a basic human right and it is an equity issue because we want to make sure that um, all students learn how to read by the time they are moving in from that place of learning how to read to reading to learn. So we really want to support that piece around equity. And um, I'm just going to I just want to clarify on my notes and make sure I didn't miss any other pieces here because this is such a critical component for um, reaching all, all of our students, our underrepresented students and historically underserved students. So impacts of low literacy, we I talked about the byproducts of low literacy rates um, earlier with one of the myths in that we need to reduce the education what happens is, is that we have a reduced educational life opportunities when we're not closing the gap in an efficient time. And we have reduced economic participation and lifetime earnings, as well as an increased risk for unemployment, poverty, and homelessness. And then those byproducts of not being able to read, which we have um, a sense of self-worth, worth, unemployment, poverty, and homelessness. So there's all these byproducts that then happen because we question our self-worth as a dyslexic or that I'm not capable of doing that and um, we have our confidence hasn't been been built or we don't have the confidence to be able to attack that text and so then there are these byproducts that then happen so we really want to intervene again early to to change these future outcomes because being able to read will change an outcome the future outcomes for our students so this is one of the pieces that talks about the percentage of grade three students not meeting provincial reading standards. And anything above 5% can be considered as an instructional casualty. So when we look at um, our historically underserved or marginalized students, it is uh, making up a, a high percentage of the population that we're not reaching. So we really want to make sure that we are reaching every student by changing the instructional strategies that we have as I call it in our core instruction, which is our tier one instruction. So Dr. Louisa Motes, who is um, a very world renowned um, author around the science of reading, um, stated this, that over 95% of kids can learn how to read. And what happens is it's not often because they are less advantaged. The, the gaps happen because the students were given different opportunities to learn, not based on their learning abilities. So it really is around our instruction and how we reach these students to make sure that we can close that gap. So the good news, and I'm just trying to keep an eye on time too, is that we know what needs to be done. And I have mentioned in one of the previous slides is that um, these students require structured literacy in order to close that gap. So the science of reading. The science of reading is a vast inter interdisciplinary body of scientific based research. And it's not the, the act of reading itself that is the science, it's the science, it's the body of research that is behind um, how we learn how to read. And what happens is, um, there's this very vast collection of, of research, neurolo neurologists, um, psychoeducational, um, all of these different bodies of research have come together to study how the brain learns how to read. And um, I I'm going to load a clip for us so that you can see it uh, because it's just, it's, it really helps shed, shed the light on um, how the brain is wired to, to learn how, wired for spoken language and not wired to learn how to read. So I'm just gonna check here and make sure. Okay. So I'm just, people are starting to put their questions in, um, in the chat. 
and I will be able to touch on all of those at the end of the presentation so that you can get the answers to the questions that you're looking for because I really don't want you to leave and feel um, that you have somewhere else to go <laughs> to, to find the answers to your questions. So um, just give me one second so I can make sure that I'm touching on all of the things that I want to touch on. So, so well reading is one of the most studied aspects of human learning. The as, as I mentioned, we refer to the field of the scientific research about how humans learn how to read is the science of reading. And having access to this knowledge is really important, clearly for teachers, but also for parents and community volunteers who assist with literacy programs for individuals of all ages. I'm going to touch on a few major points and also explain where dyslexia fits into all of this, but bear in mind, this is a very quick summary and if you're interested in digging in deeper, there are a lot of excellent books and other webinars and resources that we can send you to, to help, as I said, deeper, go deeper into that iceberg. So this is um, reading, when we think about reading comprehension, it is the simple, um, just gonna close the chat because I'm not sure. So reading comprehension is the ultimate goal of reading. And this model here is called the simple view of reading. And it provides a very useful framework for us to layer on our thinking, okay? And discuss the components of reading. So these, the two, the two components that make up the equation so that we can have that ultimate goal of reading comprehension is word identification and language comprehension. In the simple view, these are expressed as a multiplication equation to emphasize that if either factor is zero for reading, you will then get, if either factor is zero, so if I have zero in word identification, then my outcome is going to be zero. So dyslexia is a difficulty with, as I mentioned, the word identification aspect of reading. It's that big phonological awareness umbrella. Um, and oftentimes we have a difficulty and it's not, dyslexia is not binary. There is a um, continuum of dyslexia. And it is within that aspect of the phonological processing that we're having difficulty in um, is that word identification. So objects, let me see here, you get, um, so there is an area in our brain that responds to objects and faces and skill readers, what, what we like to say are made and they're not born. And this area of the brain, my notes are just a little skewed here. So, so bear with me for one minute. I'm gonna give you my analogy for, for the simple view of reading. So when I, if I can't decode a word, but then I can hear it at through, an, let's say I'm listening to a podcast or an ebook, I, I'm still understanding it, but then I haven't developed the reading comprehension because I had zero for word identification because I haven't accessed it. However, for language comprehension, if let's say I lived in Holland for, and I did for a bit, and I was able to not, I was not able to understand the language that was around me, but I could decode it because I was learning how to read. I still would get zero for reading comprehension. So when we base it on the simple view of reading, we have an anchor for us to move ahead. So what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about the science and um, learning to read involves rewiring the brain. And what I like to say is that in, in this video clip here, that I'm going to pull up. So I will have to have pause for a moment. Um, but if you feel in behind your left ear, there is this place and this is what they talk about in this webinar is that this is where um, it involves rewiring our brain. So we have some neural pathways that have um, that are not um, wired yet for print. So what we have to do is wire that 
for reading and all in all students and I'm going to show you this picture here. So this is a on the left here is a six year old non reader and then a six year old reader and that you'll see that the neural pathways it's the green imaging right there on the right hand side of the picture. That is now a reader and those neural pathways were formed through learning how to read the process of segmenting and blending and, and carrying that onto comprehension. And then the same for a dyslexic non-reader and then a dyslexic reader. So those neural pathways have been able to be developed and formed because we are teaching the students aligned to oftentimes a dyslexia student to the science of reading. So I am going to pull up this clip, Diane, because I do want everyone to see it. And okay. And if you are looking for um, another great webinar to go to, this is a great one. It just talks about um, learning how to read and and that process of learning how to read. So I'm just give me one second. Usually I'd have these all loaded, but as a mom of three, it. <laughs> It was a little tricky navigating everything tonight. Um, we appreciate your time, Catherine. And, and I love building this um, awareness because it is something that is just so near and dear to my heart. So hopefully this loads for us because I can reiterate what they say, but. Um, they have done such a, a great job. Representation of the word. So to this is Amplify. So I'm just going to move it along right here. And then it, we're just going to listen. We need to build a whole new system in our brains in order to read. And the cool thing about being in this field at this time is that we have so much neuroscience. We have tools like EEG. We have tools like fMRI. So we don't have to guess. We know exactly what is going on in a brain when it learns to read. So I'm going to give a quick high-level overview of sort of what is known from the neuroscience, just some of the big ideas that I think are important for practitioners, families, educators to know about, about the neuroscience before we dive into um, to some of the other content. So the first thing to know is that our students' brains come with visual regions for recognizing faces and objects, but not words. So this is a diagram, right? The yellow represents an area of our brain that responds to objects, and the red represents an area of our brain that responds to faces. And that's what we come wired for, to recognize objects and faces. Babies can recognize faces three or four months old, right? We're wired for this. And this is why we say skilled readers are made, not born, because we're not born with an area of our brain that responds to words. Right? We're born with spoken language, we're born with areas that respond to faces and objects, but not words. As a child learns to read, we develop a whole new area of our brain that responds to words. And this is called the letterbox. Some scientists call it the visual word form area, but it allows skilled readers to recognize words without much effort. All of you have it if you're able to read. You did not have it when you were born, but you created a letterbox in your brain. Um, and this area simply does not exist at birth or in non-readers, and it takes years to build. So I'm going to show you um, some scans from Dr. Stanislas de Haan's work, a French neuroscientist. And he did these scans and saw a notice, right? In this six-year-old non-reader, you see there's no green there. There's no letterbox. In a six-year-old reader, there is a green area, which symbolizes the letterbox. And that is what differentiates a reading brain from a non-reading brain, the letterbox, which is a very specific area of our brain. You can feel it, well, sort of feel it. If you take your left hand and you put it in the back left corner of your brain, um, back there, that's the left occipital lobe, that's where the letterbox is in your brain. Um, if, if you can read. Uh, so we see that a six-year-old reader has the letterbox, a six-year-old non-reader does not have the letterbox. In a nine-year-old dyslexic, we don't see the letterbox. In a nine-year-old reader, we do see the letterbox, right? So the big idea here is that a reading brain is very different than a non-reading brain, and we can actually see it in scans. We can see how the structure of the brain changes, mainly because if you can read, you have uh, this letterbox area. So I'm I do encourage everyone to um, watch that entire um, webinar because it is incredibly helpful to really understand how 
um, we move from the land of um, learning to read to reading to learn. So our learning, reading to reading, yes, learning to read to reading to learn. So here is the neural pathways um, and that we're talking about building a, the reading network. So by decoding a word multiple times, um, the neural pathways are formed and with dyslexia students, we need to, to show them that multiple times in many different ways and also through kinesthetic, visual and oral um, multi-sensory component is layered onto that in order for them to have that instant recall um, and create fluency. So, however, um, currently we are not doing these things. So what has happened is um, over the course of since 2020, 2012, more, the more decisions, Supreme Court of Canada rules unanimously that students have the right to effective reading instruction. And in 2019, the right to read inquiry was launched um, and the OHRC launched a public inquiry into the reading instruction after hearing widespread complaints about the inability to access effective reading instruction in schools. So in the spring of this year, um, the right to read inquiry was released and it concluded that Ontario is systematically failing students with reading disabilities and many other students. They have set out 157 recommendations for school boards and also um, the Ministry of Education and our teacher education programs. Three of those big pieces are, because we can't get into all of them here today because I wanna have time for your questions, is one, the curriculum change. So replace 3Qing with systematic explicit instruction and foundational word re reading. Uh, two is early intervention, so to provide every child identified through screening with additional targeted instruction starting in kindergarten because we know if we intervene early we can change those future outcomes and three universal screening to screen all children twice per year from kindergarten to grade two for um, risk of reading difficulties now currently what is happening is um, you may see um, some of these strategies that um, are being sent home and I want you to remember that it is with the best intention and everyone always has the best intentions. All educators have the best intentions to reach your students. And we don't know what we don't know because we haven't been trained. Um, I've learned all of this on my own and this because I was passionate about it, but educators were, were not trained um, for, for the most part in teacher education to be able to teach how students how to read. And I know in my case, I can speak to, from my story, is that was not the case. Um, so there's pieces like this that we need, really need to think about how we're supporting our readers because some of the skills that we're teaching them are bad habits that dyslexia students use that are not good habits and are not good for developing readers. So when we look at the picture clues and we're um, trying to think about what makes sense and then we skip the word, we're not using the letter clues to tell us what to do. And that is what a good reader does. A good reader um, is flexible with their vowels. And so some of these pieces are still really valid. Um, the stretchy snake and the chunky monkey and the flippy dolphin. And um, But we just want to always, as I like to say, rethink refine and remove what is not working because they're with when we align to the research we can use those three r's and i think that's a really good way for you to um, moving forward support and advocate because you are your child's best advocate and um, that is, is something that i will always um, express to parents is that that's your job is that the one thing I can always do. I can't be with my daughter at school. I can teach her to advocate for herself and I can advocate on her behalf. And I will do so in a very um, collaborative way with those educators because ultimately if what's happening at school is consistent with what's happening at home, we will get better outcomes. And that is that is all everyone wants is for every child to have a positive learning. So I am going to pass through a few of these 
because I want to break down um, how you can really help your child. So three things that students with dyslexia need in order to succeed is systematic and explicit instruction and foundational skills. And systematic being that it follows a scope and sequence. And I'm gonna show you what a scope and sequence is and your local library. Um, if they had applied, which uh, for the IDA, IDA grant, they will have um, resources that should align to this. So scope and sequence follows a shorter group of um, letters, and then those letters then go together to make words, and then those words are what is in the text. So it's very, it's also very explicit. So we're following a, a sequence from least complex to more complex in those foundational skills. Um, and we are working on sounds that are easier for us to blend together. We call them continuous um, sounds because we don't have to, and we have something else called stop sounds and continuous sounds would be like an S so I can hold that S. So and then ah, so I'm, the t is that stop sound. Um, and we will look a little bit at this. And as I said, it's an iceberg and this is just the tip. So you're gonna have to dive down a little bit deeper after today. Um, universal screen, early screening to identify the risk for developing reading difficulties and early targeted intervention starting in kindergarten. So what you can do to help now is thinking about helping your students and what you can do to ensure that you are advocating and being your child's greatest advocate is how can you help? You can write your MPP, your school board and local media and ask for um, immediate implementation of the right to read recommendations and take that collaborative approach. You know, where are we with the right to read recommendations and share information about dyslexia with your friends and families. And then you can also sponsor your local public library through the IDA Ontario. So we're going to, if again, you want to learn a little bit more, Emily Hanford, who Hanford, who has just also released a podcast series. She is an investigative journalist who has done a deep dive into um, the belief around how children are taught how to read. And if this has sparked your interest, the podcasts are equally as um, moving and it it is something that will give you a lot more insight around how you can continue to be your child's best advocate and um, collaborate with the schools in order to continue to move them ahead so what i am going to show you is some t this is a typical book for an early reader and what you'll see is um, on this page here this is really cumbersome for a student to attack and be able to recall and, and go into what we call their lexicon and retrieve all of that learning. So in order for me to be able to read this passage flu fluently, I need to know 14 consonants, short vowels, a long E spelled with a Y, a long A spelled A-E, a long A spelled A-Y. So it's very cumbersome for me to attack. So what you can do starting with your children at home, your youngest readers is, or um, if you are looking for other resources is utilize a decodable text. So a decodable text, as I said, would go, would use um, what we call a scope and sequence. And what you can see in this scope and sequence here, set one uses the, the letters, S-A-T-I-P-N or P-I-N. And um, all of the words then subsequently within that text are utilizing those letter sounds so that there's no guessing that needs to happen and that you can see that it, it goes from least complex to more complex with more complex um, digraphs and um, blends. So down here, on our next slide here, you can see how it is decodable. And sometimes our decodable texts have gotten a little bit of a bad rap, but um, 
they've really come a long way. And so your like your local librarian will be able to support you in accessing some decodable texts. And there are many decodable texts online as well that you can access. So this is a great way. And what I would say is ask your school because this is everyone is aware of the right to read at this point. Um, if they've decided to use a scope and sequence because you would like to support your child at home and if so what scope and sequence are they using so that you can then find resources to support that so that anything that you're doing at home is in addition to and it complements what's happening at the school so that they really are truly getting that that overexposure that we want our students to get in order to make those gains um, another piece that i would we're going to um in, encourage you and I talked a little bit about this was when we think about our struggling students is articulation and how we're pronouncing the phonemes in the English language and this is a great clip it's about five minutes long so um, I'm going to leave it up to Diane if this is going to be going to it is recorded so we can go back and watch it um, and I might put these links as links in um, if it can be shared out, Diane, you'll have to let me know whether or okay. not it can be shared out and then you can go back and watch it because oftentimes I'll give you an example is the letter B. We add a schwa onto the end and a schwa is when we add a, an extra vowel sound onto the end of B. So I'll, I'll produce it for you. So, the b -uh, b -uh. so in, you need to be very cognizant of how you're producing those phonemes because when we go to have a student then transfer to print and have them write and represent B, they might then add a U onto that, the end of that. If I was writing the word bat, say I say the sound B, at, I might have then a student write down B, U, A, T, and it's not aligning to how we want to produce the phonemes properly. And that's that phonological awareness piece that we really want to spend a lot of time on with that oral language piece connected to print for a dyslexic student, but also the kinesthetic, um, tactile, and um, visual component that we want to link all of those to, again, to create and fuse those neural pathways is really important. So, so Catherine, we, we do, sorry to interrupt, we do have about um, five, five questions so far, so maybe we could sort of wrap, wrap it up and get wrap, to those. Yeah. For sure. So. I would encourage you to, um, if you are looking for more information, to check out the IDA's website. There's pre-recorded webinars for helping your struggler re struggling readers, and um, you can connect with Diane at the at the library so that you can really get a sense of where those where those resources are within the class within the library to be able to support your readers. So I do want to thank everyone for listening and. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll just uh, thank you for attending today.